to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. One of the great convictions Jesus had was the need to follow the Father's teaching. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Matthew 7, verse 21. We welcome you today to our series of lessons, More About Jesus. Today, we're specifically thinking about some of the convictions of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're just joining our broadcast for the first time, we're so glad that you've joined us. And as always, we encourage you, visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. There's a host of Bible study material available from our website, including DVDs and CDs, as well as uh, video lessons and audio lessons online. You can find our transcripts and other study material in written form available as well. And the good news is it's all free of charge. If you'd like to have any of that, please visit our website or write to us or email us. We'd be glad to help you in any way as you study God's Word. Also, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by concerned members of the Lord's Church. Those members of the Churches of Christ in your local area would love for you to visit their assembly. If you've never been to the assembly of the church, you'd be a welcome guest. These are people who just simply want to go by the Bible, who want to worship God in spirit and truth, and who strive in every way and every day to give honor to the Lord. And so we encourage you, visit the Church of Christ in your area. Today we're going to be thinking about the convictions of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of us have convictions. We're probably, if we've got a family, we're convicted about making sure that our family is taken care of. We're convicted in our nation today about things like freedom and democracy and free speech and, and no doubt those things are very important, but we have convictions and we hold those near and dear to our heart and they're a vital part of who we are. Friend, as we think and as we study more about Jesus, Let's turn our attention to some of the things that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was indeed convicted about. First, when I look to Christ's life, I learned that Jesus was convinced, He was convicted about how to be greatest in the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 5 verse 19, it wasn't by wearing the religious garb and saying the things that many of the Pharisees said. It wasn't by having the chief seat at the tabernacle or at the synagogue and sitting in Moses' seat. Rather, Jesus was convicted that if you were going to be first, you need to be servant of all. Mark chapter 10, certain people among Jesus' disciples, James and John and certain others, begin to bicker and complain about who's going to be first. And so much so that their mother, in essence, asked if they can have a seat on the right hand on the left of Jesus. Can we have the chief seats when you come into your kingdom? They still don't get the kingdom, but they're wanting that. And Jesus says, whoever wants to be first shall be last. Whoever wants to be first, be servant of all. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. He who wants to be greatest, let him be least of all. Now, that's kind of an oxymoron. That's kind of a, a paradox, a truth standing on its head to be noticed. How can I be first? How can I be greatest by being last, by being least? How can I be first by being last? You become great in the Lord's kingdom and in Christ's mind by making yourself a servant. How is that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did and that's exactly what God wants us to do. Mark 10 verse 45, the scripture records, the Son of Man, came not to be served, even though He had every right. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. As we think about this conviction and really wanting to be last, really wanting to be a servant, 
Let's make practical application to that. What does that mean? Do you remember the two greatest commandments on the Old Testament? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to be a type of person who wants to be great in the kingdom by serving God. I want to ask the question, just as the young Samuel asked, Here am I. What, what would you have me to do? Speak, Lord, your servant hears. Here am I. Send me. Or as Saul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to have a servant mindset. But then, not just as it relates to God, as it relates to others. Remember the second command? First is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second like unto it? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Friend, the person who's really going to be great is the person who goes out and serves other people. How are we helping others? How are we doing good to them? Are we really taking care of the sick and the afflicted, the widows and the orphans and those in need? James 1 verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction, keep oneself unspotted from the world. Are we doing good to all men, especially the household of faith? Galatians 6 verse 10, Those who are poor, those who are sick, those who are needy, are we looking for ways to serve? And more importantly, are we looking for ways to serve people with the gospel? That's the greatest service you could ever give, is making sure that people have an opportunity to hear the gospel and become a Christian. Then we mention another thing that Jesus was indeed convicted of. Jesus was convicted of people's need to confess Him by their life. Let me give you a couple examples. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. Jesus said, If you won't confess Me before men, Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Now, is Jesus just talking about mouthing the words, uh, I believe in Christ? No, that's not the idea. The Bible teaches that's not the idea. For Matthew 7, 21, Scripture records, not everybody just looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord. What does it mean then to really confess Him? I'm doing that by not just my words. That's important, but by my Life. Let me give you an example. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said, as He taught His disciples how to really follow Him. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Me. That's what it means to follow Christ. Deny self. Life's no longer about Me and you. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live. Galatians 2, verse 20. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said to Christians, I beg you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And so I'm going to deny self. As many of us as were baptized into Christ, we've been clothed with Christ. Galatians 3, 27. The Scripture teaches that it's no longer about me and you. Deny self, take up your cross daily, and follow Him. Christianity, my life as a Christian, is a daily confession that I believe in Christ and that I'm trying to follow Him. Now, I'll give you a perfect example of this happening. Acts 4 verse 13. Peter and uh, John have been put on trial, have been brought before the council. They've been asked, by what power do you do these things? They responded by saying, Acts chapter 4, it's in the name of Christ. The only power there is. He's the chief cornerstone you left out of your spiritual superstructure in essence. And then in Acts 4 verse 12, they responded by saying, Nor is there salvation in any other name, no other name under heaven given among men, among men by which we must be saved. Now, as you think about those words, then it leads right into verse 13. Listen to this. The Bible says when they realized they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and listen to this, and then, it says the light bulb comes on, they realized they had been with Jesus. Friend, I ask you to consider, did Peter and John confess Christ by their life? You bet they did. They stood up in the face of pressure, in the face of persecution. They're going to later be beaten for speaking in the name of Jesus. They stood up and by their life, by their words, and by their actions, they daily confessed Jesus as the Son of God. Friend, that's what Christ is convicted about and that's what He wants of us. Christ doesn't want me and you to claim to be a Christian only. He's not looking for people just to fill a pew. He's not looking for people who can 
wear a cross. He's not just wear a cross. He's not looking for people who can just go out and do religious things that the world sees as religious. He's looking for people who will live for Him a hundred percent each and every day. That's what it really means to confess Jesus as the Christ. My life and yours is a constant, continual confession. We really believe in Christ because of the things we live and do and say in this life. As you think about some of the things Christ was convicted of, Jesus was convicted on how to be a part of the family of God. I want you to notice the words of Matthew chapter 12. As Jesus speaks about this great conviction, I want you to notice what He says in Matthew chapter 12 and especially around verse number 50. Listen to these words. The Scripture records, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, the context is some had came to Jesus and they said, your family's calling for you. Don't you want to go out and see them? Family's here. Take a break. Go see them. Jesus said, wait a minute now. Whoever is doing the will of God, that's my family. Jesus was convicted and knew how to be a part of God's family. How is that? By doing the will of God. Friend, it isn't just enough to claim to be a Christian. It isn't just enough to maybe do some things that Christians ought to do. You've got to do the will of the Father. Remember Luke 6, 46? Jesus asked, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Uh, you know, as you think about this idea of needing to follow Christ and obey Him and do His will, we need to be reminded that Christ wants us to keep His commandments. Do you remember John 14, 15? If you love me, here's the condition, keep. My commandments. Now, are we saying we earn it? No, I don't earn it. We're we'll never be good enough to earn it. Luke 17, 10 says, In you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. If we're saved, it'll be by the grace of God, no doubt. But must we do what God asks of us? Friend, that's how you become a part of the family of God, by following the Father, by living a life that honors the Son, and by really doing what God wants you to do. Here's an interesting conviction Christ had that is so unique to what many think of in this life. Jesus knew how to save your life. You know, a, a lot of people in life go about looking for saving certain things, save life from disease or sickness or whatever it may be. Jesus knew how to save one's life, and it is so backwards to what so many people think. Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and for the kingdom will save it or find it. How do you save your life? Lose it? What? It doesn't make any sense at all. You can't save a dollar by losing a dollar. Wait a minute now, we're not talking about money, we're not talking about finances, we're not talking about things like that. We're talking really about focus and we're talking about service again. You save your life by losing it. Losing it to yourself and letting it be found in service to the Savior. Friend, if I'm really going to save my life, it's got to be about something more than me. You see, that's what obeying the gospel is about. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20? The Bible says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? Listen now. And you are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. Save your life by losing it, by becoming a Christian by living for Christ, by having a new focus, by having a new goal, by having new priorities, and by living a life of selflessness to serve others. That's where you really save your life. You know, if my life is all about me, and it's all about selfishness, am I ever really going to be happy? Let's say that my goal in life is to just live out the pleasures to the fullest. And I go from one pleasure to another pleasure to another pleasure, you know, it's going to get old real quick. If your life's about money and you could amass all the money in the world, would you be happy? True saving of one's life is found in losing it in Christ. Being consumed and overwhelmed and consumed by the teaching of Christ and His life. That's how you really save your life. 
And in so doing that, you find life. How do you know? Revelation 2 verse 10, Jesus said, Be faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. Losing your life, you find it in eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus also was convicted on a truth that seems so unusual to many, but it again is a powerful truth. Jesus knew the secret to how to never thirst or hunger again. Listen to the words in the Gospel of John. John chapter 4, I want you to listen to what Jesus had to say about never thirsting or never hungering again. He said these words as He taught some about following Him. John 4, verse 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said to the woman at the well, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, the water of the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus basically said the same thing about food in John chapter 6. If you're trying to follow food, you'll never really be satisfied. I am the bread of life. Come drink and eat of me in essence and you'll never hunger or thirst again. What's Jesus talking about? Finding true satisfaction, fulfillment, and completion in something other than the fleshly. Have a good cold glass of water. What happens three, four, five hours later? I'm thirsty all over again. I don't care how good or how cool it is. You eat a good hearty breakfast. What happens about lunchtime? Well, the dinner bell begins to ring again and I get hungry, and so do you. In the physical sense, water and food are an ongoing cycle, day to day to day to day. We're always looking for more fulfillment and completion in those ideas. You never fully completely satisfied for a prolonged period of time. What about in the spiritual sense? Friend, did you know and do you realize that Christ can give absolute and complete satisfaction? You know, as Paul thought about the cares of this world and as he thought about some of the things and in, in, in life that often we get caught up in, Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. I've learned to be a base, and I've learned to abound. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. How could Paul find that satisfaction only in Christ? Philippians chapter 3, Paul would say that, you know, he, he, he had tried everything. He had the greatest teaching. He had the greatest Jewish background. He was from the strictest sect. And he said, I count all of that as garbage compared to what I found in Christ. Regardless of what we're chasing in this life, pleasure, lust, desire, money, a better job, a bigger home. Did you know you'll never really find happiness in those things alone? Let me give you a case example. Think of the wisest fool to ever live in the Bible, given wisdom on high by God and he squandered it. His name was Solomon. And Solomon tried everything in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's trying to find real happiness and meaning in life. He did that in building things, projects. What did he say? Like it's vanity, trying to catch the wind. He did it in power. What did he say? Like trying to catch the wind. In wealth and money and women and wine. And he said all of that was vanity and grasping after the wind. Well, Solomon, did you ever find anything that gave you real satisfaction? Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Where's meaning at? Where's purpose? Fear God. Keep His commandments. Listen to this now. This is the whole duty of man. Why? God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So many people are chasing things in life that aren't the meaning of life. You cannot find fulfillment if we're striving after things which will not lead us to the real goal of life. Fear God. Keep His commandments. That's the true essence and meaning of life. If we can be complete in Christ, and Colossians 1 and 2 tells us we can. And friend, I can find peace beyond measure. Peace that passes all understanding in simply being a Christian, living for Christ, and striving to follow Him every day. Now, we also mention this, and this is, again, kind of different than the way the world thinks. Jesus was convicted on how to live a life which would lead to never dying. And you say, well, wait a minute, how can you live a life where you'd never die? 
You know, if the medical world could find that secret, wouldn't the world be different? But we're not really talking about it in a physical sense. I want you to listen to the words of John chapter 11. And I want you to notice what Jesus says. After the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus says this in John 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to Martha, Lazarus' sister, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now listen to this. And whoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Can you imagine Jesus being convicted of such a powerful thing? Jesus said, if you live, really live, and believe in me, you'll never die. Now wait a minute. Jesus can't be talking in a physical sense, for Lazarus just died and he raised him. Jesus died. Others in Christ died. What are we talking about? If you live and believe in Jesus, you'll never die. Friend, life is not found in bringing oxygen into your lungs. Life is not really found in the nutrients that your body has to have to survive day to day. The essence of life is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, listen now, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If I'm living for Christ, if I'm living in Christ, if I'm in the safety, the shelter, and the hope of Christ, what's dying? Dying is not the worst thing. Did you know that for the child of God, dying is the best absolute thing that could ever happen to them? How do we know that? That's what Scripture records for us. That's our hope. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Revelation 14, 13. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. If we really believe heaven is real, it's going to last forever, and that we can go there, and you can't get to heaven without dying first. Friend, you don't ever really die. If we have the promise of eternal life, death is only that next step to life itself. And so what a wonderful thought Jesus taught us about knowing how to live without dying in this life. Here are some other things Jesus was convinced of. Jesus was convicted of the need to hear God's Word. Listen to the statement that is made multiple times in Revelation 2 and 3. To the seven churches in uh, Asia, seven congregations of the Lord's church in Asia in Revelation 2 and 3, at the, sometimes at the beginning and definitely at the close, Jesus will say, To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, Mark 4 verse 24, take heed how you hear. Uh, Luke chapter 4, take heed what you hear. Jesus emphasized over and over again and was convicted of the need to hear God's Word. Now, I want you to think about that little refrain in every one of the letters to the seven congregations, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. What's Jesus saying there? How many people do you know that don't have ears? And what are those ears for? Well, they're for listening. What's God's point? I gave you ears for the purpose of hearing. Use them wisely. Friend, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah to a hard-hearted, impenitent uh, nation cried out, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 22, verse number 29. They didn't hear. They wouldn't listen. What happened? They suffered the consequences in destruction and captivity. When we stop listening to God and start listening to other things, we're living a life that is filled with despair and hope. We've got to continue to listen, to actively want to know the will of God, to have the, the heart like that of Saul, like that of Isaiah, like that of Samuel. Speak, Lord, your servant hears, and wanting to do and follow the will of Almighty God and the need to submit to Him in this life. Now, let's mention one other thing Jesus was convicted of. Jesus was convicted of the all-inclusive and wonderful nature of eternal life. I want you to listen to Matthew chapter 11. In the great invitation that Jesus gives, listen to the words of Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden." Is light. We talk about the all-inclusive nature in this sense that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Let whosoever will come. 
and drink freely of the water of life. Revelation 22, verse 10 following. God wants all men to repent. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, and wants all of us to be saved and have eternal life. Friend, as we think about these convictions, and, and, and as these convictions are very near and dear to our heart as well, we want you to know that one thing that Christians desire the one thing that at the Gospel of Christ evangelistic work we want more than anything is for people to be saved. If God wants all men to be saved and know the truth, then I'll assure you that's what we strive for as well. To help people know God and to be saved and to come to take of that great invitation. Let whosoever will come. Come unto me, all yet labor and heavy laden. How many in this life feel the burden of sin? Psalm 38 verse 4, the psalmist said, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Do you bear the burden of sin? Do you bear it alone? Do you feel the sting of sin, the agony, the anguish of it? Friend, why not let Jesus lift that burden? Why not let Him help? Remove that yoke. Take His yoke upon you. Remove the burden of sin and have the hope of eternal life. Some of you may be thinking today, well, how do I do just that? How does one become a child of God? Friend, you've got to hear the words of the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. I know faith's essential for the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 11 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. And so I, I've got to have faith. And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so I first want to turn my attention solely to the Word of God. Doesn't matter what men say. Doesn't matter what men's books say. What does the Bible say? Once I've heard the Word of God, I must believe in Jesus. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, You'll surely die in your sins, John 8, 24. I've got to make changes in my mind and in my life. Jesus said to some who thought they were more righteous than others, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. I must make that good confession. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, verse 10. And then I must do what the Bible says to be saved. Did you know Scripture says, baptism, also now saves us. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you become a Christian? If not, we encourage you to let these convictions be a part of your life. Obey the gospel and join us again as we study more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. With his pride, this is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.